thanks, uh, thanks to the DSPD board for the invitation to this conference. It's really great to be here in mean, the uh, session of data visualization. And yeah, uh, I'm a data visualization engineer and I'm here to talk about how data visualization can help in the storytelling of climate change. So let's dive straight into the problem. Uh, the problem is the following. We have uh, science on one side and we have 7 billion people on the other one. And what is really important on this topic is trying to communicate what science is doing to this, well, to everyone basically, right? Because um, climate change is something which definitely will change our environment and our planet. There is a problem, but there is also an opportunity. And the opportunity we have is the, the massive access to internet that we have right now in the world. I mean, <laughs> almost 60% uh, of the population right now they have access to a mobile phone and at least to some browsers. And this is, this is a really great opportunity for data visualization because people have a mobile phone. I mean, and we have seen it, I think. Um, they're, they're a little bit lazy when it comes to read text, you know, and, and really to stop into things. You know, I mean, mobile phones, you know, we like pictures and we like diagrams and we like infographics. So this is a great moment to work on data visualization because we have the tools and we also have an audience which is really eager to look at something which is graphical. Um, so what is science doing? Science, they are already telling this story. I mean, they're telling the story in scientific papers and they are really answering the really basic questions like uh, what is changing, uh, what is it happening and what will it happen? Uh, this is just an example of a scientific paper that will be generated from climate change. This is just the ocean deoxygenation. But if you look at the database that they are using, um, we can identify a bar chart, we have four maps, and we have four time series. So they are really conventional in the, in the way they display the information, and they rely on these really uh, basic elements of what is changing, what is changing, and when will it happen. So, how data visualization can help in this problem is just to bridge the gap. I mean, you can see this gap in, in between, right, between the opportunity and the visualization they are using, and data visualization can, can fit this gap and try to reformulate these really basic elements and put them on a web browser. And this is the whole idea of this, of this talk. So, um, <coughs> I will use these really basic elements as the outline of my presentation. I will start a little bit with the tools, and then I will try to explain or propose ways to reformulate these basic elements, the bar chart, the time series, and the map. And finally, I will try to talk a little bit on, on why climate change is happening and how data visualization can also help science itself to tell the story. So regarding the tools, um, of course, there are hundreds and I mean, there are hundreds of ways of, of displaying information. There are more than 200 or 300 uh, data visualization tools and software. And um, what I'm proposing today is the following. Um, climate, climate science is based, on, is based on resistant models. One of the problems of climate change is that you cannot run experiments. I mean, you can just put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and see what happens, because that would, might kill a lot of people. So um, we rely basically on, on numerical modeling. And usually we get these huge uh, files, these NetCBF, uh, georeferenced files. Uh, but this is more or less about a gigabyte per experiment, and there are, of course, uh, hundreds of experiments. So what I'm proposing today is just a little bit of Python, uh, really, really simple scripts. I mean, you, you will see some code in the slides, and you will see that this is the, really the most basic thing you can do in Python. And just to reduce the file size, we uh, have some JSON uh, files that are in the order of uh, 100 or 200 kilobytes because we need a, eventually we need a, a website that is really responsive and really lightweight. And um, yeah, and then everything what I will present today is based on D3. Um, so for those who are not familiar with D3, uh, D3 is a JavaScript library for visualization purposes. And it's great because uh, it builds on really, really simple uh, features. Uh, just to illustrate here quickly, I mean, you just can draw a line with angular circle polygon, and everything related with these geometries, it's based on numbers, it's based on the data. So you take the circle and the position of the circle, the radius, the, um, the color of the circle, everything. I mean, you can really customize 
everything based on the data. So let's start with some examples. Um, I will start with the bar chart. I mean, how data visualization can reformulate the typical way of representing a magnitude, an amount, or, or, or yeah, just a mass of something. Uh, when it comes to reformulate the bar chart, this is probably the most rewarding uh, task you can do because um, you can really beat the, the bar chart really easily. And here are a couple of examples that I would, that I would like to start with. I mean, the one on the left. Uh, is, this is a classic. I mean, this is just stack dots. Uh, you assign a magnitude to an individual dot, and then you just file them, you know, and you can differentiate between different latitudes and, 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 and everything. Um, works like a charm. Excellent. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see more of a really specific discrete thing, which is drawing polygons. Here you can see some pyramids. This is some other output based on, well, some uh, oxygen boundaries that you can find in the ocean. So you can really represent the, the volume of water that you have uh, in, three, in these low oxygen regions. And basically, the three, you just draw this triangle, and the width and the height depends on the, depends on the volume you have. So you can really spot, you know, that some other, they are underestimating these thresholds, or some of the, some other, I mean, uh, overestimate. Um, you can see a green dot uh, in these two projects, and this means that these two projects they were accepted. Uh, but I will display some of them too that they were rejected, because when things go wrong, uh, there is always a story behind, and it's always interesting to know why things do not work in, in this particular environment. I mean, you can add a lot of things. So I will start with this example that was rejected. Um, this is a joy plot. I mean, uh, in the joy plot you can display. Um, well, several things, uh, when you want to compare massively, uh, well, in this case also these existing models. Um, this is the just altitudinal band. I mean, on the left you have the west, on the right you have the east. And yeah, sure, I mean, you can say, well, all the models, they got it more or less right, you have the maximum on the left, they got the minimum on the right. Uh, but this, this data visualization was, was rejected. Why? It was rejected because of precision, because it's not precise enough. Um, if you're closer to the scale, of course, you can say, you can estimate more or less the exact value that you have in your, in your amount. But if you go to the light, if you, if you go to the, to the blue curves, it's really difficult to spot, I mean, uh, what's the difference between two of them. And this is a real landmark of science. I mean, you can do colorful, beautiful, fancy stuff, but as soon as you miss precision, then the data visualization is rejected. Now, the time series. Uh, the time series is the opposite of the bar chart. I mean, it's really difficult to reformulate uh, a time series. Um, why? Um, time in Europe, or in the Western civilization, is linear. It's mostly linear. So you always rely on a horizontal axis, and then, you know, with the time marks, and then you have on the vertical axis the magnitude you want to display. So it's really difficult to bend the axis, and it's really difficult to reformulate the axis. I have a couple of examples here. Uh, well, actually, this is not time. This is an histogram. Uh, it has to do with, uh, with time. But I would like to show you this example, just to illustrate how sensitive this, this topic is. This is an histogram. And usually, the histogram, uh, you have the values on the horizontal axis, and you have the, the number of times the frequency on the, on the vertical. All I did was rotated 90 degrees, right? I did it because then you can mirror. I mean, if you see the upper part, you can mirror the axis to the other side. And then you can differentiate between reality in gray and the models in blue and yellow. And you get a lot of space, you can tell a lot of things, you know, on both sides. Uh, it might look simple, but this was rejected. This was rejected on the basis that um, first of all, I didn't have the axis on the right position. And on the other hand, this has to do with, well, this is an ocean variable. This is not an fixation. This happens in the ocean, in the surface. And these people were working in the ocean. And they looked something that was going down. And they said, uh, why are you plotting depths? And I said, no, this is not depth. This is just the values. And they said, no, this is depth. And it was rejected, yes, on this thing. It has to be clear, it has to work like this, you know, you have to see it straight away. And again, I mean, 
Science is really sensitive to this thing because science is on the spot. I mean, climate change is on the spot. I mean, you can see it on the news, there is a lot of denial, um, there is a lot of controversial stuff. It's not like NASA, you know, if NASA says there is an asteroid, you know, who's going to hit the Earth, everyone believes. But it's not the case for climate change. So I'm not saying that science is conservative, but they're really, they're really afraid that the message is not clear, you know, and then one of these figures get it to the news, and then there is a lot of you know, noise and say, well, this is not true and this is not correct. Um, another time series that was rejected. Uh, this is actually a hit map. I mean, you can see clockwise uh, the months, and it's one of the rings, it's a different year. It starts in the center in 1945, and the outer ring is 2017. So we have a dot, you know, on each one you get a yellow dot. This means that that day, the temperature was above 27, 26 degrees, I think. So if you look at November, you know, November, December, you can, uh, you can see that we have a more density of uh, yellow points, which means that over the last decade, you know, they are getting an, an extra month of, of summer, more or less. This was rejected. Why? Because in 1945, the circle is smaller, and in 2017, the circle is bigger. So there is a geometrical distortion, which is not related to data. This is something that are different. These two years, there is something geometrical, which is not, which is not telling the same thing. And just on basis of this, uh, this project was rejected. Um, however, uh, the duty and the task of a data visualization engineer is always to push the limits in trying to keep on challenging the time axis. So I would like to show a project from Hurricanes that I did, uh, again, trying to break the, you know, the rule of the perpendicular axis and the time on a, on a linear uh, way. So this is hurricane data. Uh, this is the database. I mean, first column is the date, second column is the time step. It's every six, six hours. Of course, you have the latitude and longitude, so you can make the trajectories, as some people mentioned it before, right, for the news. You always get the line getting into the states. And you get these four numbers at the end. And these four numbers, um, these are the distance from the center of the hurricane to the point where you have a constant wind, right? I mean, you don't measure the hurricane in terms of distance, but in terms of the wind speed. So there is always a kind of a virtual circle around the center uh, where the wind speed is constant. In this case, 34 knots. So how to challenge the time axis? Uh, and this is where D3 is really good at, that you can really draw uh, whatever you want. Um, this is a spider diagram. I think technically the, the name is a spider. And what I'm displaying here, I mean, it's one of the shapes, it's one of the circles. These are the four points that you get of the constant wind. So of course, at the end, uh, well, I'm coloring them like uh, when you see a shape, which is kind of blue and green, this means that we are talking about the first six to 12 hours. Uh, if this is yellow, this is really the end. I mean, this is after five or six days. So you can see on the lower left part, I mean, the hurricane Katia, and you can see the shape of the hurricane. I mean, if you get these four points, you link the four points with the three, you color them, depending on the time step, and then you make the transparent. So you can have the time axis uh, perpendicular to the screen. And this is an alternative way to display hurricanes, and to display the temporal evolution of the shape of it. I mean, you can see the tropical storms. I mean, when the hurricane is not in a hurricane, but a tropical storm, uh, those are the blue and the green ones. And you can see the shape, which is a little bit more irregular, right? And finally, when you see the really beautiful picture of the hurricane, and this corresponds to the yellow one. So this tries to represent what's the temporal evolution of a particular feature. Now, the map. Um, well, of course, maps, cartography, this is a huge topic in itself. Um, what I would like to display here is just the capabilities of D3 on, on doing maps in this context, let's say. So, here I would like to differentiate between uh, output from a, from a system model. Um, in this case, usually you have to display something that covers entirely the planet. So you have to distribute tiles, right? I mean, you have a shape, you have an area, and you have to fill everything with these uh, tiles. 
And the second case will be just uh, display uh, small features, right? And you don't have to cover the whole earth, you, you just need something you know, particular in a particular location. So uh, here we can see already what's the problem of D3 uh, in this case. If you look at the map projection in the middle, and if you look at the, at the grid cells, if you take a grid cell in the equator, it's a square. But if you take a grid cell in the, in the high latitudes, in the pole, you have to change a little bit the grid cell, right? Because latitude is, uh, is more compressed. So you, you, don't know, you don't have a square. I mean, you have, you know, kind of more of a triangle, you know, that projects over the, over the Earth. And D3 is not able to make this change of shape of the tiles, you know? If you display a square, you display a square. It doesn't matter if this is the equator, it doesn't matter if this is in, in high latitudes. And, well, luckily there's really smart people out there, you know, who were able to make the, make the numbers, make the calculations. And what I'm displaying here is the way D3 uh, can really change, you know, and bend these shapes to display uh, model data. So first example, binary graded file. Uh, this is a really low resolution case. Uh, so, but at the same time, it's really precise. I mean, this is the model output, right? You get the grid cells and you can point them on a map. In the middle, you have the contours. Uh, this is a new feature which came with D3 version 5, I think, that actually you can interpolate between the, yeah, between the squares. So you get a much more beautiful map. And the one on the right is the, is the hexagonal binding. I think, I'm sure you have seen these really beautiful, uh, colorful maps sometimes. And um, this is really cool, but uh, I just put here uh, the orange color, not red, but you have to be careful because, because of what I said before. I mean, this is binding. I mean, you have an hexagon in the equator and you're making the average of something which is behind this, uh, this hexagon. So in the equator, probably you have four points, maybe, let's say, four points. You go to higher latitudes and you put the same hexagon. But in this case, the latitude, I mean, the latitudes, they are compressed because of the projection. So you have the same hexagon, four points, you have the hexagon in the higher latitudes. Maybe you are making an average of 10 points, 12, 16, much more. So this is not realistic, right? I mean, even though it seems that we are showing the same thing, it's not because one is the average of uh, a fewer amount of points and in the northern latitudes uh, it's an average over a larger amount of points. So this is uh, regarding the tiles. Now I would like to display a video uh, on small features. Uh, this is a project I did on wind. Yeah, there you go. So this is really D3, right? This is really D3. I mean, you, can, you have a map projection, and you can just draw a line. The line is proportional to the wind speed. You get the orientation right, and then you can put a color. I mean, you can put yellow if the wind is going to the north, blue if the wind is going to the south, and then you just iterate or idea, and then you get these uh, smooth transitions, which make it more or less more attractive. Now, um, one last. Yeah, bit, um, yeah, one last part on, the, on, the, on this presentation, which is the multivariate, the multidimensional. I think multidimensional would be much more accurate. And this is a typical exercise on climate change and what the scientists are doing. I mean, they have uh, these earth system models. Um, if, if you see the, um, the second plot, I mean, the, the carbon dioxide of the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide is increasing, it's not increasing linearly. I mean, depends on the vegetation, depends on summer, when the vegetation is working, let's say, and you're taking carbon dioxide out from the atmosphere, then it comes winter, so, so this mechanism is no longer working, so the carbon dioxide increases again. So there is a seasonal cycle here. And models, they're really good at, uh, let's say, associating this variability with different parts of the Earth, because if you have a model, you can label every single carbon dioxide you have on the planet and say, you're coming from Russia, you're coming from North America, you're coming from Europe. And we have these uh, measurements on, on 31 stations over the Earth. So at the end, you have 27 models and you have to look at 11 regions 
contributing on over four seasons on three qualifications. So how do you display all of this? And for this, data visualization can really help. And I would like to finish with um, this video of a project based on this analysis. Uh, first of all, you pick one station, this is one in Alaska, and then you have D3, which draws a dot for every single station, every single region, four seasons for each region, and then you have the 27 models. Um, and yeah, well, so yeah, and this kind of this kind of tools help um, with some interactivity, right? Probably the next step is interactivity and how to really uh, how to really tackle the problem of complexity, which eventually will will come. Uh, and yeah, it's also an ingredient of, of climate change. So yeah, I will stop here, and I would like to thank you for your attention.